We've been talking for the last couple of weeks about photosynthesis and cellular respiration. And all of that has been building to a larger umbrella concept, the carbon cycle. We mentioned in our studies of photosynthesis and cellular respiration that the two are highly connected. We notice that the reactants for one are the products for the other. So for example, in photosynthesis, the reactants, the things that it needs are carbon dioxide, water, and light energy, a form of energy. And on the other side, in cellular respiration, we see that the products are those things. They're carbon dioxide, water, and another form of energy. Notice that the words that I've put in bold and red have something in common. They're all different forms of carbon. There is a law in science called the law of conservation of matter. And what that law says is that matter doesn't just appear and disappear out of thin air. The carbon dioxide that was used in photosynthesis doesn't disappear. Those molecules, that one carbon and two oxygen, they don't just vanish. They're transformed into another form of carbon, in this case, sugar. And in cellular respiration, that sugar is transformed into another form of carbon, carbon dioxide. That carbon is constantly moving. We call this biogeochemical cycling. And carbon isn't the only thing that does it because all matter, everything that everything is made of, obeys this law of conservation of matter. So biogeochemical cycling is our scientific term for the process by which nutrients move through an ecosystem. We have bio, meaning life, geo, meaning earth. So chemical nutrients cycle through the earth and the things that are living on it is how we could break that word down into a workable definition. So here it is. It's beautiful. It's complicated. It's everything that happens with life on Earth. It's the carbon cycle. And parts of this you're already very familiar with. We see CO2 from the atmosphere go into plants through photosynthesis, where it is stored except for sometimes when it enters into living organisms when they consume it and consume that sugar. Regardless, all living things eventually die and carbon enters the soil as organic matter. The same thing is happening in the ocean. Photosynthesis and respiration are constantly happening and dead marine life becomes sediment. Any of that has the possibility to be transformed into a fossil fuel. So this is really storing carbon away from the carbon cycle until someone comes along and burns it, releasing that carbon back into the atmosphere as CO2. And that happens too when living things, plants, animals, everything, goes through the process of respiration. And it can happen in processes like forest fires or clear cutting, where you've got carbon that was previously being stored in a plant being returned to the atmosphere. And we could make it even more complicated than this. There are constantly interactions going on where carbon moves from one living thing to another, or from storage to not being stored, to being free and available. 
But these are the key processes of the carbon cycle. We're very familiar with photosynthesis. Photosynthesis's job is to store carbon in the form of sugar. And its opposite, cellular respiration, takes that carbon in the form of sugar and releases it again as carbon dioxide. Decay or decomposition means that carbon becomes a part of whatever is surrounding something that has died, whether it's soil or absorbed by a fungus or deposited on the seafloor as sediment. Sequestration refers to plants storing carbon as the stuff that makes up plants, like cellulose. So a major structural component of plants is that carbon in the form of cellulose. And plants can store a heck of a lot of carbon. And carbon can just dissolve in water too, making the water more acidic. So that stores carbon as carbon dioxide or carbonic acid. Recently, there's another major component to the carbon cycle, which is combustion. So combustion takes CO2 in some form in which it has been sequestered. So think plant matter and think fossil fuels. And it releases that CO2 by burning it. And this is a highly desirable process, I'm not gonna lie, because burning carbon generates a ton of energy. And we can capture that energy and use it to do um, pretty much all of the stuff that we do in modern life from fueling our cars to running everything in our home through electricity. The downside to that, of course, is that all of this carbon that was previously stored either as fossil fuels or as plant matter gets released into the atmosphere. And carbon, as you know, works wonders at trapping heat when it is free in the atmosphere. So an increase in combustion we have seen tied to an increase in global temperatures. So the net takeaway here is that carbon doesn't just move back and forth between photosynthesis and cellular respiration. It's a lot more complicated than that. Take, for example, the fact that living things, some of us, need to consume other living things in order to survive. The survival that we mean here is getting carbon that we can use to make energy, so sugar. And you probably, as elementary school students or middle school students, studied food chains and food webs. So the images on this slide should look fairly familiar to you. But just in case you've forgotten or just to refresh your memory, Food chains and food webs are both ways to show how energy, meaning sugar, meaning carbon, moves from one living organism to another. So in a food chain, we see a direct path from one organism to the next, from grass, which is a producer, something that makes its own food, to consumers, which we label primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, depending on how far removed they are from that original grass that produced the energy in the first place, to decomposers that break down dead things to return energy back into the environment. 
A food web is a little more complex. It shows not just the grasshopper being eaten by the frog. It shows that, well, that frog also eats butterflies and dragonflies and a variety of other insects. And that frog doesn't just get eaten by snakes. It might get eaten by a bird instead. And grasshoppers don't just eat grass, they eat whatever vegetation is available. So to break it down for you, the difference is that a food chain is simple. It goes from producer to consumer to consumer to consumer, and sometimes we add a decomposer down at the end. A food web shows the interactions between trophic levels. So each one of these steps along the food chain is a trophic level. So at the primary consumer level, you've got, in this case, a chipmunk, but also that grasshopper from the last image. Anything that is strictly an herbivore, as you move up to your secondary consumers, you've got herbivores and omnivores. And you get some of those at the tertiary consumer level too. And then if I had included a quaternary consumer, that would be something at that point that is strictly a carnivore, something that is only consuming other consumers. So each one of those groups would be a trophic level because they share the same function in their respective food chains. Now, this process doesn't result in the perfect transmission of energy. Think about when you eat something. Not all of that energy that you get from your food is going to go into building you. Right now, as I'm talking with my hands, I'm moving. That's burning energy. I'm burning fuel just to keep my body at the right temperature. That's consuming energy. Anytime my cells need to make more cells, that's consuming energy. So there is this rule for how much energy moves up from every step on the ladder to the next. And it is very easy to remember how much because it's right there in the name of the rule, the 10% rule. So every time energy moves up a trophic level, 10% of that energy is passed on to the consumer. When I eat a hamburger, I'm getting 10% of the total available energy that the cow got from eating grass. So here's how that works out mathematically. Let's say that sunlight contains 1 million joules of energy. About 1% of that makes it into the primary producer. So 10,000 joules. Every time now that that energy moves up a trophic level, only 10% of it moves up. The other 90% is lost. So 90% of that 10,000 joules went into the plant growing, the plant moving. Plants do move to reposition their leaves to turn them towards the sun, stuff like that. So the consumer in this diagram, the grasshopper, gets about 1,000 joules from that plant. And the mouse gets even less because the grasshopper is going to use up 90% of that energy. So the mouse only gets 100 joules. By the time it gets up to the top of the ladder to the hawk, that hawk is only getting 10 joules of energy out of that mouse. So think about how much more you have to eat to be at the top. 
we are going to spend a little time on this carbon cycle stuff. So do not fear. You are going to hear about this energy again. For now, go find some work to do. Pick out your assignments for the week. Be good, be safe, be kind. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. And remember to wash your hands.